අන්කල් සැම්සන් එයාගේ කාරක විකුණන්න තීරණය කළා. ඇඩ් එක දැම්මා විතරයි. සට සට ගාලා කට්ටි එන්න ගත්තා. හැබැයි සතුටින් හිටපු අන්කල් සැම්සන්ට වාහන විකුණන එක එපා වුණා. AMW වෙතින් කරදරයක් නැතුව විකුණ ගන්න. අපෙන් නොගත්තත් අපි ගන්නවා. Sri Lankans are rising. Sri Lanka is rising. We are all rising up for the real needs of this nation, for the rights of the citizens of this country. Make no mistake, it is not a party, not a carnival. Of course, the younger generation is very creative in how they do it. Now, amidst all these developments, are you having the right insight? Do you know what you need to know, especially when it comes to an important topic like bribery and corruption. Welcome to your weekend's most profitable and insightful 60 Minutes. This is Biznomics. I'm Tarandu Amra Sekara. Our focus today will be on understanding the real impact of bribery and corruption on our economy. In the famous words of His Holiness the Pope Francis, who once said, the cost of bribery is paid for by the poor. What exactly is the cost of corruption? And what can we do to reduce the impact of this and in fact eradicate corruption from our economy. To talk about this, we have a very special guest joining us who is none other than Ms. Nadishani Pereira, the Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka. Nadishani, absolute pleasure to welcome you to Biznomics and thank you for being here. Thank you for this opportunity, Karen. Well, we are meeting to discuss a vital topic, bribery and corruption. At a time, Nadishani, I must say that across all social strata, people are talking about this, from the highly intellect uh, peoples of the top boardrooms all the way up to the daily wage earner who probably had no access to education on economics or anything, even they are talking about the real impact of corruption, how we got, as a country got to this uh, dire situation we are today. Definitely, I'm sure bribery and corruption had a major role to play. Let's try to demystify some of these developments and to start with, what exactly is the definition of bribery and corruption? Let's get that out of the way first. Yes, so the most simple definition of corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. Power entrusted. To on whom do we entrust power? The citizens in our country have entrusted our sovereignty, our power on public representatives. They make law for us, they determine policy, uh, they basically uh, decide how the country goes forward. And you, you have the executive, you have the legislature. Then, then they uh, delegate the task of running essential public services and implementing policies to the public officials. So the public officials also have enormous power to make decisions that impact our lives. And this power has been given for one and only one reason that is to serve the people serve the country now if that power is misused by these parties for personal gain beyond you know they all get a salary beyond that to get some other favor that is that is corruption now there are many forms of corruption i know the most common thing and normal any person knows and uh, lives that experience would be bribery uh, that we call often the petty corruption you know it could be a, a traffic police uh, you try to offer a small payment and get away without going through the process it can be that you want to expedite a process when you go to access a public service in a uh, institution public institution you try to offer a small gift it can be money it can be something else uh, you know this is these are all bribes this, these are payments that are they are not supposed to get because you have to give that service what happens to the person who cannot pay right but then there are other many forms of corruption for example we often now hear people talking about commissions you know whether this party or that party solicited a commission uh, by why the why, particular national project a project a project but why why would some party some private party or a government you know want to give a commission if their proposal uh, is for this particular development project is good enough uh, they don't have to pay an additional payment so often this is done to get on top of the list or to be, get chosen and often when because you have either quoted high or your quality is low then the other bidders uh, 
So in, in accepting uh, that kind of commission, what, what who will lose? We will end up paying more. It's Correct. public money. And, Malishani, and that, now, um, we recent reports, we are also questioning with regard to the Express Pearl disaster. Did Sri Lanka get the right compensation? Or was there another invisible force which was in play that took uh, a particular bribe? And uh, as a result, they did not pay the full full compensation that was due to pay. Not, not that it has fully been uh, disclosed or anything, yeah. but the questions are being raised. Yes, certainly. And I mean, that uh, that uh, leads us to another rampant form of uh, very uh, a serious form of corruption uh, is also abuse of public uh, property. Uh, uh, we have, uh, if you take the public officials and even the public representatives, the parliamentarians, they have uh, something like a fiduciary duty towards uh, protecting public property. Uh, the, they are stewards. Uh, they have to, if you take all our natural resources in our country and the public finance that is raised through the taxes, right? All of these have to be protected for this generation, future generations. Now you cannot make decisions for a political purpose or for to get a personal gain. It has uh, implications for generations sometimes. So sometimes uh, yeah, it, it, it's like you say a particular uh, particular personal benefit. Uh, it, it can be uh, uh, another form of corruption leading in, from right. there is uh, we what we call nepotism, cronism. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think it's time we talk about these things sure, because sure. uh, because uh, nepotism is basically when when it's it's all within the family. Okay, you give uh, uh, influential, powerful positions without going through the normal process right. of recruitment in a public institution. You basically get your kit and kin into positions and your henchmen. Yes, and that's where the cronism come. You know, they are all connected people. Now, what happens here? The moment you have your family or friends in this in powerful positions, you are not going to be held accountable. Correct. Neither are you going to hold them accountable. And you know, you can get away with anything. Yeah, and that's when you start dismantling a public institution. And and when the people who are working below see this, what example? We we need to uh, provide uh, have a zero tolerance policy for corruption, and that needs to start from the topmost people and they need to not only say it they need to live that otherwise you give a really bad example uh, even favorism and conflict of interest this is one of the most uh, underestimated and, and overlooked I would say form of corruption Thandu, which let me just explain that for sure, for sure. Uh, is it's because uh, it's also because it's a lot of us uh, ordinary people, maybe we are right now, you know, uh, shouting this slogan saying eradicate corruption, but we have all also contributed to these forms of corruption. Honestly, for any form of corruption, one party cannot do it. We At least two supply. parties, oh, exactly. So this is where uh, you you uh, you basically uh, say you're awarding a contract or recruiting somebody. Uh, you have another interest. Right then, you know, you should not uh, then basically recruit chapters. For example, I cannot recruit my friends or family members to my organization. I'm not even a public institution, but that has uh, that brings a conflict of interest. Right. If we are uh, awarding a particular contract, I cannot give it to people that I know because there is a conflict of interest. And then there's whole thing of when whenever a uh, uh, MP is elected or a public uh, official gets a position, what happens? All their relatives start calling them yeah. can you get a job for my son my yes. daughter you know this is completely and we see it, corruption. for example there are some public officials some MPs where they are appointed and then after that their son or daughter will be there one Second. of their secretaries uh, the son-in-law daughter-in-law becomes an additional secretary they're not even qualified but they think of it as their personal public I mean the public property the public institution becomes like their personal property so exactly I, I'm fully with you on that and we see today uh, this corruption being even at the highest level in our country and as the and as we know uh, higher the level you are in any organization you have more power and thereby goes the famous words power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely am I right? Exactly. And uh, the more power we entrust on a person or an institution, the more uh, uh, accountability that we need to ensure. So basically, we have to tighten uh, the system so that the spaces are minimized. Because Correct. honestly, like you say, and we are all... to the people. Yes. And, and we are humans. Correct. Temptation will come. 
to people. And honestly, sometimes it can be that the official comes to the position with a uh, okay noble purpose. Yeah, I want to do something and all. You know, others also won't let you be right because, like I say, corruption. This happens. It's like a network. You will be, you know, approached by parties, by private sector, massive companies, by individuals saying, you know, just this is how it has been done. Yeah, this, you know, this, this. exactly. And you know, you know, no harm. You know, it's not like it's your money. Nobody's going to figure it out. You know, and and it's very difficult to resist this. Uh, that's why I like to say that. I mean, we are sad to say that we we see systemic corruption in correct, the country correct, correct. because that has become the way of doing things. For sure, right? And when we talk about uh, the situation of corruption in Sri Lanka, I believe the Transparency International's uh, list uh, where it ranked Sri Lanka among 102. I believe we are worse than even some of the neighboring countries uh, when it comes to the level of corruption. I want your thoughts on that. Like, how bad is the corruption in Sri Lanka? I see your eye smile. I'm quite sure you have some interesting points to share with that. <laughs> and also, what is the exact cost of corruption, Adishani? Because they say, I mean, even some of the UN reports are showing that uh, they estimate around 5% of the global GDP is, uh, is the cost of corruption. And that people and businesses pay more than $1 to $2 trillion every year as corruption. But I believe there is a bigger cost than the monetary cost, isn't it? There is the, the cost of the breakdowns of the society. Uh, and there's a plethora of... I would say intangible costs, which are much more harmful. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I think I'm so glad that you asked that question because I think we uh, have not uh, really gone into or reflected on the cost of corruption and going even beyond the numbers. Uh, and I, like you said at the beginning, right now there is an unprecedented uh, sort of awakening of people towards this. I mean, we've been here as an organization fighting corruption for 20 years now, and we've actually not seen this amount of Inter. So it's the right. Right, correct time to uh, speak about just it. Just to add to what you were saying, it's no longer a case of people uh, up, rising up to send one political party uh, yeah. and get another party or send one person get another person. Yeah. People are, their, their slogans are changing, their demands are changing. They are saying, show your accountability, audit your accounts, you know, give us our money back. People are changing their demands as well. Which is uh, absolutely, uh, extremely, like, it's, it's progress. So about the first question, now, for example, the latest uh, corruption perception index statistics um, uh, basically showed Sri Lanka uh, among 180 countries. Uh, we, we have gone down to the ninth, uh, sorry, 102nd Second. position and come down from the 94th position, but that's a ranking. Let's look at the score. The score uh, is basically 38 from uh, sorry 37 uh, from 38. The score is the higher the better, okay. right? So we've gone down a little. But if you take the last 10 years of CPI statistics for Sri Lanka, we've remained between this 30 and 40. You know, the best was actually uh, back in um, uh, 2012. Interestingly, we got 40 out of 100, the score. Correct. And in 2016, it, uh, the lowest, our lowest has been 36. So actually, what we, and this corruption perception index is uh, looking at a particular point. It is the perception of public, uh, sorry, private sector yes. on how corrupt a country's public sector is, basically. Understood. And uh, looking at World Bank, World Economic Forum, such statistics. Um, so it's not uh, fully comprehensive. There are other forms of corruption. Yes. This is just the perception. Um, but there's always a reason for the private sector to have such a perception such per of the perception. public sector. Exactly. And, and the sad thing is for 10 years, we have not shown progress. And But I'm glad that at least now, and we are, it has actually hit the bed and butter of you know, people. So talking about corruption impact, uh, it's simple, simply like uh, we've, been, uh, we've been as an independent Sri Lanka uh, now 70 uh, years, right. and we've had huge, massive amounts of uh, ADB, World Bank, various development funding and projects, just as if you are to pinpoint. And all these were given to develop this country. And you know, as a country, what do we lack, Tarindu? Right? We don't have too many people. We have perfect weather, adequate resources, excellent positioning. Beautiful country. Uh, exactly, right? I mean, we should be able to you look after ourselves and you know, definitely not be in this position. And uh, it is clear that a, 
that probably the main or one of the main reasons for this is that throughout these years, the, 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 all that investment towards developing the country has been stolen by certain people, the people in power, the, yeah. the power from, and people who are, whom we have entrusted power, like I told before. So what happens is then the, the, what trickles down, so you have these things that are coming to the country, then this is like a leak. These people are stealing from all forms. What goes down to the actually needy people, the vulnerable areas, the areas where actually you need development is very little. In fact, you, when, when people steal funds, you, you, then you don't even have enough funds. For example, Tanil, why should there be villages uh, without water still, without a road like, you know, you, 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 uh, you saw the recent accidents where children died because they tried to cross over, I mean, uh, schools without basic necessities. We do not have to be like that. How many times projects would have come to uh, address these issues? But either, you know, a low quality product has gone or that money has been stolen. So then the response is, you know, we don't have enough money. But what happened to the money that was there? What happened to the project? So it, it honestly, it can make or break a country, the, uh, how you handle corruption. And um, uh, we are going yeah. to come back into more yeah. details on that. Stay tuned. We will be back after this short break. This is Bisnomics. AMW again. Abhi one of अपी <laughs> 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 Welcome back to Bisnomics, your weekend's most profitable and insightful 60 minutes. We are in conversation with Nadishani Pereira on the acute problem that this nation faces with regard to bribery and corruption. Nadi, now we were discussing about uh, the real impact of this and the cost of uh, bribery and corruption. Please do continue. You were explaining that it's due to all these uh, bribery and corruption issues we see uh, that some villagers are lacking basic facilities, basic resources and then they come back and say, we don't have money to develop it, but then that makes us beg the question, what happened to all the money that came in? Yes, and I like to uh, uh, elaborate on your very uh, valid point of, you know, the cost of corruption is even beyond uh, the numbers. Now, even this shows, right, it affects the life, the quality of life of people. Why Especially should... Especially the people uh, who are already disadvantaged, the ones who exactly. are already economically challenged. Yeah, because who, yeah. it gets passed down the, the, the chain... And it's always the ones at the end that will suffer. Exactly. And, 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 and this translates into social issues, right? This, this, and, and the whole, uh, I would say, human rights, a country's human rights cannot be uh, achieved uh, if there is a lot, if, if there is corruption, there is a direct link because even access to basic services is a human right. Uh, and, and, and even uh, what happens then, uh, even if you look at political and civil rights, right, freedom of expression and assembly and uh, even, you know, the, we have right to information now in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, if what corrupt parties in power would do is to cover up their tracks they would want to suppress this. If people start asking questions, yeah. you know, you try to minimize the accounts. opportunities. Yeah. yeah. So, so in a sense, you, you affect uh, not only that you, you are violating uh, certain rights of people, it also leads to the violation of economic, social, cultural rights. And then the whole democratic system, because see, uh, if this country system is, is to run, People need to be able to trust their public representatives, trust the public institutions, trust the judiciary, right? And in the moment you're being bribed, that's why even in all religions, uh, there is very serious statements about the detrimental effect of bribery corruption. Because the moment, like you take a court of law, if, if somebody can bribe a judge, that's the end of justice. 
right? And and if an institution is uh, now dismantled because it's like a corrupt network that running it, that's the end of that institute. People will lose faith. Or, and also people might, now sometimes you and I have the luxury of saying maybe, okay, they are corrupt, we are not going to go to that institution. But certain other people will no only, they have no choice, have no choice. right? And, and then they will have to now succumb to this. You know, they have to also adapt to this. They have Correct. to somehow pay. I mean, even if you look at sexual bribery, yes. I mean, it's high time we come Talk out with it, it because Absolutely. of the social stigma. I was going to ask you on that as well, yes. Yeah, because of the social stigma mainly Tharid, that uh, women do not come forward because uh, we have a cultural issue, you know, yes. of blaming the victim uh, rather than blaming the, you know, perpetrator. But you, we know and in we are our supposed work, to be a, too cultured to talk about this problem. <laughs> yes, too cultured. So it's okay for the problem to happen, but it's not okay to talk not about okay it. Not okay to talk about it. Doesn't make it. sense. In our work with the people, we've heard so many stories uh, of, especially if they are, say, women-headed households, vulnerable women, put in this position. You know, either, you know, they have to need, they need to access that service, but this is the only way that is given, you know, and then uh, they, they succumb to that, and then uh, it, it becomes like a vicious cycle. And sometimes these officials pass information and say, you know, that lady is easy for you to, you know, try something like this. It, it's an imagine then how that family is affected, psychosocial impact, social impact. So you, uh, the whole system, uh, it, it will bring down the country's so holistic development, social development, economic development. And I am glad that we are now uh, opening our eyes to these things. But I think uh, while, complete, uh, while uh, uh, you know, applauding those who are now uh, standing there in protest, uh, I'm appealing humbly, including to myself, saying, let's also do uh, have a moment of self uh, uh, self uh, uh, reflection Correct. you know uh, introspection because at in what points in my life have I contributed yeah. to bribery because it sometimes start with petty corruption Correct. and the it people, might be that extra money you pay you have to pay the guy at the petrol station so that exactly. he pumps extra fuel now for you yeah and they you know the garbage collecting Correct. people or, I mean it's at all right? it, it, start, it starts at the it, it goes both ways it, yeah. it starts at the bottom and then it tends to go up and it starts at the top and tends to come go down. down. I believe that's why they uh, refer to corruption as a cancer because it spreads it uh, in all directions in, in the body of the country. Yes. Now, um, when we look at fighting of bribery and corruption in Sri Lanka, what are the authorities that are available that are meant for fighting of and fending uh, of uh, bribery and corruption in the country? So the very specific uh, authority with the sole mandate to uh, uh, address uh, corruption uh, allegations is the commission to investigate allegations of bribery and corruption, what Correct. we briefly say, uh, bribery commission. And I, and I believe that uh, in Sinhalese, this is what we call as Allah Sahad Dushana Commission. Dushana Commission Sabah. In short form, we say Allah's Commission. So basically, uh, they, they are mandated to entertain any complaint. It can be at top level, it can be at a uh, you know, bottom level, but in any complaint of taking any form of bribery or corruption, any citizen or institution can file and they can, they have their investigator, uh, sorry, investigative team yes. and uh, they will look into that uh, and they are supposed to obviously address that and impose because we have a legal system which makes corruption a crime. Correct. Right. So you 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 will have criminal penalties in addition to you having to you know pay, pay uh, compensation. Yes. Right. So basically, they are the ones who can file action under that law. But in addition, if you look at institutions, uh, they are supposed to have a mechanism where if the officers are engaged in corruption, you should be able to do engage in what we say whistleblowing, Correct. right, to the top people. Whistleblowing as in coming and revealing. Uh, yeah, exactly. So whistleblowing again is basically you are revealing information about a crime, right, and in this situation about corruption. Now we know that we even have the victims and witnesses protection authority of Sri Lanka and a particular law right but the awareness of people about the mechanism is not good enough and I do understand that there is this whole thing of being threatened by corrupt because corrupt parties can be 
very powerful. Absolutely. Sometimes, uh, often, they link with the underworld. Uh, you know, so the people are scared. So that's where we are trying to even work with the authority to see how we can create something like a social protection mechanism for those who come forward. Uh, but they do try to provide as much as possible safety. But whistleblowing is essential. Uh, establishing a whistleblowing um, system is essential in every organization, not only public institutions, because then at least you give assurance to the victim, say sexual bribery or it happens in private sector you know, Absolutely. You know that at least this mechanism is there and often you there you have the option of being anonymous you Correct. know of course the more evidence you give easier for and them to follow a, up. a system like that having a culture where whistleblowing is encouraged, uh, encouraged. can also and be a deterrent be. for uh, towards preventing people uh, being involved in bribery Definitely. and corruption that's a good yeah, point yeah, Nadishani. yeah let's talk about uh, a burning question now we always say we lack the dollars that we lack the foreign currency now we are aware, Radishani, that over the last few years, and definitely I think bribery and corruption, uh, it's not just something we can only point the finger at the current government. It has yeah. been going on, as you said, since independence, yeah. this problem seems to have been there. Only thing is it keeps on getting worse from the looks of it. Um, Nadishani, we are not attracting the foreign direct investments that we should be attracting and that we used to attract. Whereas we see so many other countries around the, the region from mm -hmm. uh, the neighboring countries to India, um, to some of the Southeast Asian countries, they are attracting so much of foreign direct investments. Mm. We have heard so many uh, news items, details of projects, investors that wanted to come and invest in Sri Lanka, but because they were being asked, what am I getting from it? How much are you willing to give me if I am to allow you to start this project? They decided to back out because some, some of these companies they have a strict policy of yeah. no bribery and corruption. corruption. If there is any bribery or corruption involved, they are out of that country. country. Is bribery and corruption a reason why we have lost out on so many foreign direct investments in this country? Yeah, I do not have statistics, of course, but uh, based on the information and, you know, the, when we talk to, uh, say, the retired officials and uh, those who are in this sector, when we talk to our colleagues in the private sector, uh, you know, connected to these companies, that is uh, definitely uh, a reason given that it, uh, that it, it is so uh, disappointing sometimes, they say, uh, to see, uh, because uh, even, say, even some companies, uh, that that's that's the, one of the huge problems because private sector is also uh, a, a party that is engaging in corruption and you know but then here they sometimes say it's several layers and now what they normally do is when they have to pay this kind of facilitation or commissions they they have to add it to their cost Absolutely. so it becomes not a worthy uh, feasible investment for them for sure. right and and then you and we have are, we are certain uh, foreign direct investment projects uh, where some of the work had even been started, those projects also had to be cancelled off and uh, there are yeah. stories that the Imagine. reason is not providing the required And you bribery. might end up paying compensation. Absolutely. Because, and you know, the country loses <laughs> the reputation as well. Of course. And connected to that, another point is if you take uh, institutions like the Financial Action Task Force. Now, if like good companies, like you said, who are looking at, to invest in our country, before that, they do a proper study, right, of the invest in investment environment. So they look at how the FATF has rated Sri Lanka. And it was just a, a few years back that with great difficulty we got out of their grey list. That they, they look at the risk of money laundering um, and uh, black money, basically. And I believe um, in recent times, uh, Uganda is under a lot yeah. of uh, microscopic focus from the international community over possible issues yeah. of money laundering. Yes, so so and and that's where you know when uh, when we initiated uh, uh, projects like Port City, uh, with some of us we even challenged it in court because uh, that had provisions that enables that area to act as a secrecy jurisdiction, okay. right? Because the thing is, while uh, it's like a tax haven kind uh, tax of tax haven, and no questions asked, yes. you can bring money. See these things are. Uh, are are not uh, like the Caymans uh, and the Solomon. Yeah, it's it's not going to be considered as positive by genuine investors, right? The ones who are doing some kind of underhand or unlawful activity. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good place. But is that how we want to address the issue? You know, is that is so that how we want to grow this and country? And now our Fitch ratings and all these things are going to be checked, right? By now, and the whole stability of the country, the political stability. So right now, would an investor take a chance with us? 
is a question. Absolutely. But of course, if they see that we are taking actual concrete steps to identify these loopholes, say, in our constitution, in our legal systems, and uh, to, uh, to address those where yes. the corruption is enabled, and if they feel that they're at a leadership level, there is genuine commitment to uh, uh, you know eradicate or stop or minimize corruption, sure. they will start looking at because because we are that much attractive as a place, Understood. right? To invest. Interesting yeah. thoughts there, Nadishani. Auditing. How exactly can we get this going and make sure public officials and even those who are in higher levels of power are held accountable for the wealth they are hoarding? Let's talk about that on the other side of this short break. This is Bisnomics. MW Vikunupahana Vitrakma in the gun. Punumana gunno. Paranavahana gunno. Art Samuaga Namaru Karaka gunno. Saliganda, you couldn't hang in the vein. Patulin Salida. Leasing Kalatibu. Leasing a settled Kalapi gunno. Kokratek, sugar gun. Up in Nogat, that upi gunno. Welcome back to Bisnomics. We are in conversation with Nadishani Pereira on the acute situation with regard to bribery and corruption in Sri Lanka. Nadi, now let's talk about the key word that we hear everyone is speaking, auditing. Auditing the accounts, the finances of some of the top level public officials, even the highest level public uh, official for that matter. What are your thoughts on this? Because clearly for a long time this culture of auditing was uh, something that uh, we never really had. Yes, at one point of time the auditing department was held as an independent body, but I believe now it is coming under uh, one of the ministries. Still. We do see a rising role that uh, this uh, auditing department of uh, the public sector will have to play. But in general, how important is auditing for the public sector uh, in preventing corruption? And are there any um, case studies of countries that have come out of this corruption problem due to having a proper culture of auditing the public sector? Um, well, uh, auditing, uh, if you take as a process, it either can be uh, used uh, to audit an institution, right? And, and the, uh, I think some of the conversations we hear now is about auditing persons. And Individuals. The video, yeah, that actually, there is no process, uh, uh, a mechanism where you audit individuals, right? What do you do for individuals with, a quest with questionable assets or questionable behavior transaction is you investigate them, Correct. right? Now, with regard to auditing, uh, we, for to audit public institutions in Sri Lanka, all public institutions, the power, the, the, the power that uh, has been given to the Auditor General's Department, and they, they are supposed to still be act, uh, an independent organization. They can call for any document uh, in any institution, and the, the, the problem is that uh, they uh, report to the parliament, right? Now, the, the question is, so we, if you go to their website, you will see the work they've done, the reports. The question is once they figure out and say they see issues, when they audit, they see issues in the account, they see there is some problem happening, then will the parliament take steps beyond that? Or if, if will that institution take steps? So beyond that, so that's where I don't want to say at this point, uh, I think citizens need to really push for uh, the strengthening of uh, parliament's oversight role Correct. on public finance, the two key roles that the, uh, our parliament has. Madhushari, but having said that, we do, we do live in a country where even when people have been proven to have carried out murders, they are being given pardons from the highest level. Do you think in a country like that, the parliament will really take steps towards uh, politicians who are involved in bribery and corruption? <laughs> so that is the thing. I think this whole conversation about the need to abolish the executive presidency, one reason that is given all uh, as an example where the, the executive powers are uh, exercised in a questionable manner is this pardoning. You know, because honestly, it's an extremely uh, demotivating, problematic uh, provision there because uh, it, it, it also kind of belittles the justice process, Correct. then the impact on victims. Completely undermines the, the, the process. And the, the message you give, like you say, it's exactly. not a deterrent message is the opposite. Like, you can get away doing anything. Exactly. You know, it is actually the original reason of any this kind of pardoning in any country is 
you know, by a, 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 a mistake in the justice system, if an innocent person had ended up going into prison, Correct. you know, you have this little space to give that, get that person out. It's not like, you know, or you, you know, there are people there for really small petty crimes, so they just couldn't pay a fine and they yeah. ended up, you know, that kind of, it's not for these, uh, you know, well-established, proven criminals, you know. So that's uh, coming back to that. So the, par the, the thing is, the parliament oversight, it's not one party, you know. So there is that checks and balances because then you have all parties, then they can question and debate. Right, but when the power is with one minister, and like it often happens now, and sometimes, like the parliament recently, as you saw, they were questioning why the minister is not even coming to parliament to answer these critical questions uh, about the pu public finance. So basically, um, um, we we need to strengthen, uh, we need to push that parliament does that role, and for that, citizens need to move out of this mentality that parliamentarians are there to give us things. Uh, give me that benefit, that this benefit. No, they are not here to give us things. They are here to make laws that will enable this country the to run properly. Laws to, and, the, and the policies to run this country. And amend laws, where certain laws are now outdated or whatever. And they are here to ensure that public finance is managed in an accountable way, no stealing, you know, and then the public institutions then under, that are coming under the ministries are supposed to provide all the services. Right? If we, but we have this mentality, if from the moment they are elected, you know, can you give, uh, you know, can, you, know you, you ask them benefits. Right. If you talk to a child to a school or Exactly, and even like you know, they are supposed to come. If there's a funeral, yes. they are expected to give some, uh, you know, gifts or something. And you know, if you talk to them, their MP tells you the rough cost uh, they have to incur to keep their uh, base happy. Uh, water base happy. So now they have to think of earning that because Correct. it's not like they Which get comes in massive the form of salary. Corruption. And about the auditing, your original question, uh, I think in terms of holding um, public officials accountable, public officials and public representatives both, the asset declaration uh, is an important tool. Now, they are both, both these parties are supposed to every year submit their asset declaration. This has to give all the information about not only things under your name, your wife, your children, or if anybody else is holding it under your name. Now, you can lie, but the thing is, if it's if you if it's proven that you lied there, then you have getting criminal charges. Okay. Now, why we have even STI said we've been advocating to publicize that at the moment. They just, for example, MPs give it to the speaker. Public official gives it to their head of the organization. It goes into a cupboard. Uh, we won't see. The only authority that has power to call an asset declaration at any point of time is the Bybury Commission. If they get a complaint against a particular person, they can call for it. Correct. Right? So, so what we are saying is, and take the Correct me if I am wrong, yeah. but yeah. once you have done an asset declaration, and if you are proven to be having any other assets apart from that, that can be uh, made public property. Isn't uh, that the after, purpose? After the, yeah, they, then you first will be asked to answer Correct. as to then you need to establish that you have earned those two legitimate means. Correct. You had to answer, like you, you had to say, how did you get that with your salary, everything you have revealed from mm -hmm. where did you, or why you didn't reveal that. Right. So basically, why we are saying to make it public, take the additional step, and you can on your website, or you know, you can publicize your asset declaration. Nobody is stopping you from doing that. And if so, there is a natural verification that happens. No, right. Now people know if there's MPs in their area, they normally know that this person has these, these assets, and they can cross-check. I saw so recently some people are doing it on Facebook, they Absolutely. published it, because that's a natural process and in, if citizens find something that is really uh, questionable or missing there, yes. they can ask the Bribery Commission to look into Understood. it. Yeah. Um, unsolicited tenders, now whenever the government is getting a particular um, a service or a particular product, they're supposed to call the tenders, there are basic guidelines to be followed, even a simple government organization, they go for a, they go for a paper advertisement, they go for this uh, three uh, quotations uh, or other particular number of quotations and then there is a process. But we increasingly hear about tenders being awarded without following the right process. Of course, they uh, nicely term it saying, oh, we are just cutting out of the, cutting out all the bureaucracy. We are fast tracking development, fast track development. I believe that is the new mask they are trying to put on yeah. some of these bribery and corruption related activities. But how does 
unsolicited, unsolicited tenders lead to uh, corruption, uh, Nadi, and how big a problem is this in Sri Lanka? Because we know that there are so many different uh, projects, government projects, which are being handed over based on this method. Yes, it is a big problem in Sri Lanka uh, by not, not just the number of projects, but those projects by the value. These are not the, you know, really small uh, projects, but these are the massive ones that involve our uh, most precious uh, natural resources. And these projects uh, are also, for example, this unsolicited proposal system that's happening uh, is where you also see not just some random private company, but other countries with their own geopolitical uh, interests are using this process. Now, if it's about a, a, a huge uh, initiative, a project like building an airport um, um, or the harbor, uh, this has to go through a tedious process, if its usual process would have been, you know, there it's evaluated from all angles. Economically, is this feasible? If you are taking a loan, it, we need to be able to get the money, get a good return, right? Otherwise, it's a loss. Economical feasibility, but also environmental sustainability, social impact. Will this end up, uh, you know, putting so many people to the street because they lose their income and these people Correct. were, you know, self-sufficient and now because of a so-called development project, you know, who's actually benefiting? And people should be given space to know about this. In fact, they should be consulted. That's how real development Correct. happened. You know, Dialogue and with stakeholders. Yeah, with, you must have. And, you know, and so, and if it's an a country needs to have its own uh, development plan. It can't be based on what this person and that person Correct. comes up. Because that's that's when you are that's when you are allowing a political purposes to determine the country's future path. There but should be a common political independent national growth plan. A, 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 yes, a national policy should not vary even if the government change. Correct. Right? It's a, it's this is how we will develop these areas and address this long standing problem. That's why there's a push for such mechanism now. For and sure. that policy needs experts also, you know, to contribute, because they are the ones who know the subject matter from all angles. So here, uh, here, while we have some priorities, we, we know, we've been identified by certain uh, ministries, you get some, uh, uh, this kind of uh, unsolicited proposal, and um, uh, with very, now, but the current situation is that you may not be calling for counter proposals. Now, Sri Lanka government uh, tender procedure, there is this thing, that's the procedure they had to follow. There was, uh, uh, there, is, there was a provision to accommodate unsolicited proposals where after you get such, you had to actually call for counter proposals and you have to go through some evaluation. You know, but this was again changed, uh, again uh, changed, you, know, you took it away, again the next government came and again brought in, again the next government came and again took it. Sure. So, you know, you, you can see that it's not really for the best interest of the country. Why, why cannot you call counter proposals? Why do you have to go with just one and this very, and the specifications that are given, uh, what we learned from officials is that uh, it is limited to feasibility in a very narrow sense. Right. Nadishani, on a final note, how do you think the laws of the country should change in order so that we can fight off uh, bribery and corruption in a better way? Because right now, simple things, for example, it may be not always the laws, it may be the mechanisms for business. If, an in, if a particular party is coming to make an investment into the country, my question, why should it go through a minister? Why can't we have a proper commission that looks into uh, these uh, investments? For example, the BOI is there, right? Why is it that we hear stories about the ministers having to get involved? And also, when a bribery or corruption is reported, what action can be taken, political independent action? For that to be enabled, how should the legal framework of Sri Lanka change? Your thoughts as your conclusion. Yes, uh, so there are several key changes that are required, touching on all the points you thought uh, you mentioned now. Uh, so with the interest of the time, let me pick up, say, four sure. key changes. To start with, 
uh, we need to remove the 20th Amendment to the constitu Constitution. And I'm making this not as a political statement, from strictly looking at accountability and transparency point of view, uh, 20th Amendment uh, took away any possible accountability that was there in the Constitution by centralizing power uh, to determine all appointments to all commissions with the president, right? And it is a, a one person's decision. Sorry. Like you say, that's that's not, uh, you know, that not uh, pro-accountability. So basically, uh, we need to bring back the Constitutional Council. We need to bring back the Procurement Commission, Audit Commission, these commissions that were put out. We need to bring back the um, uh, the, the power the, for, for, for the Bribery Commission to act on its own. For example, what we say, Suimoto, like power, where the Constitution gives power. You don't need to wait till somebody complains to you. Yeah. You can initiate action. These things were all taken out, right? So uh, that, that's some of the reasons why I say we need to bring back, at least go back to 19 and address maybe further strengthen that. Uh, secondly, because that's at a high level, governing level, right? Uh, Public Service Commission, all these commissions can then act independently. Correct. As much as possible, we should try to get that structure. You know, structurally, it's not enabled. Then we need uh, to, to uh, amend this real uh, uh, old asset declaration law to make it compulsory, uh, mandatory for public officials to publicize, publicly discuss their asset declaration. Uh, because then, you know, there's no option. You have to do that. Now that everybody is awakening to that and saying, yeah, yeah, we are clean. We also want to be audited. Yes. Then why don't you push for this law? Absolutely. I mean, they can make this law, right? Yes. Yes. So, you know, and then the thirdly, um, uh, we, we need to uh, we need to bring out a comprehensive law for the recovery of stolen assets. You hear citizens talking for about sure. it to bring Give us back our stolen money back. Exactly, a lot of the stolen money at a high level, high big amounts. And these amounts we can't even imagine, right? When you hear billions, millions right. are being held out of our country, right? In safe havens, they are transferred through shell companies, through money laundering mechanisms, and now they sit as uh, various valuable assets in various countries. Right now, to bring this back, we do not have the sufficient uh, legal mechanism in the country. But this was discussed; a process was initiated, and what we hear is that there is a draft law. So why don't you bring that? Correct. Because otherwise, uh, we have we have some things we can initiate, like through mutual legal assistance, to start the process. But it is very difficult without having a law that comprehensively addresses that. Because that through that you bring an independent asset management institution. Because after you bring it back also, it needs to be managed so much so that the ultimate thing what we want is that it is distributed among the ultimate victims of that corruption. Absolutely. So until that, the law we look has to look after. Last point, we need a law on campaign finance, right? Uh, that is another uh, major way accountability of public representatives is compromised because now there is no law that requires them to publicize who's funding their election campaign, or there's no limit. Correct. So some people will have massive funding, maybe given by often private sector entities. Some estimates even show it's around 100 million for a campaign. Exactly. And some, so one thing is the whole equity is gone because some people, the genuine guys maybe are unable to give, they have such mega, ma major campaigns because, you know, they don't take that kind of money. And then, but the, the voters only hear these guys who are, you know, taking. And what happens? Why, why would a private entity give this amount of money to a, 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 a prospective uh, public representative? For because sure. they will want the favor back. Correct. They will. So if you want to do your role properly, there has to be some kind of control in terms of how campaign finance and that uh, campaign finance is utilized. So yeah, those are some proposals I'm saying very critical. Madhishani Pereira, you are definitely very passionate about driving out bribery and corruption from this country and indeed all genuine citizens of the country are. Thank you so much for joining us despite your busy schedule and we at uh, TV1, we wish you all the best with all the uh, future endeavors of eradicating this cancer of bribery and corruption from this beautiful nation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And to all the citizens who watched today's program, we hope that the insight that you got will help you to make sure that you stand up, not just for your rights, but also towards driving out bribery and corruption from this nation. Sri Lanka belongs to all Sri Lankans. Let's make sure that the future Sri Lankans, the future generations who inherit this nation, 
inherits one free of bribery and corruption. I'm Tarandu Amra Sekara. And no matter what industry and business you may be in, have a profitable and corruption-free week ahead. I'll see you with the next episode. This is Bisnomics.